So we'll call the meeting to order at 11.30, and uh, I trust someone is recording minutes of the conversation that we had today. Judy and Tomas, thank you. So our first step is to determine whether or not we have a quorum, which of course relies on the list of signatures, which is still out front. So as soon as, uh, as, soon as Carolyn comes on in and lets us know that we have a quorum, we can move on. <coughs> yes, we have a quorum. And make sure everybody is signed in. If you're going to vote, you need to have signed in. And being a church, we're using the honor system about whether or not you're qualified to sign in as a voter. All right, so having done that, Tom, if you would be so kind as to open us with the devotion. The Lord be with you. I have two verses from the second chapter of Philippians that I would like to read, Philippians 2, 12, and 13. Therefore, my dear friends, as you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, but how much more in my absence, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who, who works in you to will and to act according to his good purpose. It is this grace. Continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. The danger is that we would hear that as righteousness, like somehow it is by my works that my salvation is won. That is not what it means. It means by working out our faith, our salvation with fear and trembling, it means growing in grace and the trauma of growing. It means becoming more the vessel of Christ's spirit that we're called to be. It's extensively about, about discipleship. Go, baptize, and make disciples. So with fear and trembling is allowing the spirit to have its way with us, that we might go through the anxiety of what it means to grow in his will and to discern his way, that we can continue to be his people ever more effective in this world. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, your word is life. It is our hope. It is our call, and it is our vexation. We ask for your spirit, Lord Jesus, to come and to breathe in us and to breathe through us, that we might, in fact, be your people in this place, called to witness and to serve those whom you call, that we might seek out your will and that your word would be clear to us. Grant us joy in our gathering. Grant us a sense of conviction in our conversation. Grant us always, Lord Jesus, the joy of being with one another in your church, in our differences. May that be the power to this community. And the people of God say, Amen. Thank you, Pastor Tom. All right, we have a couple of brief uh, conversations, presentations before we entertain the motion and begin discussion as a congregation for the vote. First, I'd like to introduce a young man in the audience and give him the benefit of the doubt on that. Uh, his name is David Sorkin. David is an attorney who is representing us in this endeavor with an admin housing on a pro bono basis. He is with a firm called Mills Meyer Sorkin in downtown Seattle. Thank you, Dave. It's been, uh, it is a joy and a delight um, to be with you again. Uh, I must confess that it's been a while since I have been here. Uh, I was a practicing lawyer in Seattle for 30 years. I uh, did a substantial amount of work with the Northwest Washington Synod and um, the Regional Governing Council. I was a visitor with you back then. Uh, Barbara and I moved to Chicago. Um, for six years, and I'd like to believe that I'm living proof that God has a sense of humor or a sense of irony to select a trial lawyer from Seattle to move back to Chicago and be a denominational um, secretary. Um, but we are back uh, in the Northwest again um, with the lessons that we learned uh, in Chicago, and they were really, I think, significant lessons. Uh, and as you reflect on your work today, just let me hold these out very briefly to you. Um, first, um, I remind myself all the time, uh, that this is God's church and not uh, your church or my church. 
And then we are always about trying to discern what God is calling us to be in the particular circumstance um, that we find us. And I think that that's an important message to bring to you uh, today. Um, the second is that Lutherans don't always agree, and that's okay. Um, I had the delight of being with your board of trustees this past week, and I can tell you that they had a robust conversation talking about lots of issues, um, asking what God is calling this church to be. And I think that's a healthy thing, even though it's a little bit countercultural. To be able to disagree and then come to the communion rail and realize that we all share um, a common faith, I think that that's um, really significant. I also believe that uh, one of the lessons that I've learned that, that it's always good to remember and is that we are church better together than we are separately. So St. Luke's is able to do its ministry because it's part of the Northwest Washington Synod and that's part of the ELCA. And it's just doing marvelous work. It is working right now on your behalf in Western Africa, um, addressing Ebola issues. One of the significant, um, I learned yesterday, one of the significant uh, hospitals in rural Liberia is actually run through the Lutheran Church there. And I appreciate the fact that you're grappling uh, with difficult issues that you're trying to discern what God is calling you to be. So I'm here as your lawyer, the congregation's lawyer. Um, I may not be able to continue to do this, but I told Dave, uh, your president, that at a time it comes, I think that when it comes that I think I need to refer this to someone else on a for-profit basis, I will do that. But now I'm just delighted and honored to walk with you uh, to help you discern what God is calling the congregation to do. I would like to introduce another gentleman who is very kind to join us today. His name is Bob J. Jacobs from St. Margaret's Church. And Bob uh, has has walked our walk. Well, good morning. And I noticed, and it's very important for me, I wore my name tag because that's one of the constant things we have at St. Margaret's. Wear your name tag, it helps people to identify, even if you know somebody else that comes in may not come. So, uh, Nancy and I have been at St. Margaret's uh, for 29 years. We got there in 1985, and it was pretty stable. Then we went for a building project, and we consecrated the uh, sanctuary in 2003. But as you know, things get, we have a great capital campaign, and when I became senior ward, as much as Dave was president, we had a $2.8 million debt, and this was at uh, the end of 2006, beginning of 2007. So we had a real crisis on our hands in about five years from that point. What are we going to do? How are we going to pay this down? So two new parishioners, Jennifer Robertson and Scott Robertson. Scott is a, a builder, is in real estate, and Jennifer was in the planning uh, commission at that point in the Bellevue City Council. As it is now. Um, so they suggested, said, you know, you guys have a lot of parking. What if you put affordable housing on the parking lot? Oh my gosh, you know, you thought, you know, somebody had built this parking lot specifically just for St. Margaret's people in parking. That was the biggest hurdle we had to overcome is what are we going to do about parking? Well, folks, after we got uh, through all of this, you know, we try to educate what kind of opportunities that we uh, are going to have. That was the best solution we had. Some people said, well, we can just sell the church and go move someplace else. Well, not really. Um, we had, uh, and Scott was very good. He says, you know, we have to do a CPA, a comprehensive uh, uh, you know, plan. Yeah, yeah, comprehensive plan. So he helped us with that, and uh, and bless his heart, David Zoki was our chapter, our uh, chancellor at that time, and he did all the pro bono attorney work. Uh, so we started launching this ex exploration, and we, we started probably early 2007, uh, working with Imagine Housing, because there was some connection with St. Andrew's Housing Group at that time. And it, Changed the name to Imagine Housing. And they came and talked with us, and they they are wonderful people to work with. You can't ask for a better group that you're going to you're gonna connect with. Because they do most of the work for you. Because they know the connections, 
they know who to talk with, they know what paperwork you have to do. Because when you have a congregation like this, you have some expertise here, some expertise here, some here. But to get it all together, that's what those folks do. We met probably, oh, once a week for two years before we actually uh, got something going. And it, it was education with the congregation. We worked for a year just to get the congregation <coughs> amenable to this thought of taking some of the parking away and building affordable housing. We started out with 100 units were going to be built because we had enough space. We had three and a half acres. Uh, and if you recall in 2008, the economic crisis went down. Well, trying to find funding for 100 units was quite a task. So we settled, uh, looked at 60 units. And that, was, that would be kind of mad, uh, quite natural, but the crises, I mean, the economics down and down and down. So we ended up with 41 units, and the, and the only reason we ended up that way uh, is because of, of the local financing and federal financing through the VA, because we had to dedicate 20 units out of 41 for veterans. Uh, so that money came in, and there, there were several sources of money that came in. So it was about a $12 million project. It took us, uh, 2009, I think, is when we, let's see, 2000, 2006, 2007, 8, 9, at the end of 2009, we started building, and it took about 18 to 20 months. And so the residents have been in there for, oh, about three years now. Um, we did have some angst with some people. Uh, we had an attorney who's no longer in the congregation anymore that said, my gosh, you're going to get these people in, in this building and you're going to have all kinds of violence and all this stuff. We haven't seen any of that. Uh, we have a thrift shop. Some of the people go over and shop at the thrift shop. Uh, we've had some people come to the congregation and participate in the service, but not very often because we want to let them do what they need to do in their life, because it is transitional housing. Um, let's see what else is happening. Uh, we've, the campus, if you've never been by, St. Margaret's is right on the corner of uh, Newport Way and Victoria Boulevard. And, uh, the campus really looks much better than the parking lot. We lost 25 parking spots in the whole thing, which is pretty nominal when you consider that uh, uh, you, what you can do for families. Uh, and we're surviving very well. Right. So with that background, uh, are there questions? I have some canned questions that were sent to me, but I'd rather have you folks ask some questions. Well, they, they uh, I think we agreed at the end that it would have been completely taken care of with 100, 100 units, with 41 units. Uh, it took care of about 1.3 million. So then we had another capital campaign. So at the end of this year, we'll probably have maybe 300,000 left that we're going to refinance, which is very manageable for us. So it didn't completely go away. We wish, wish it had, but um, anything else? As far as the arrangement, the, some of the folks are going to be parking out in their parking lot because we have a garage underneath ours, but they don't seem to want to use that for fear of getting in and out easily. Um, but that really hasn't been a problem. We've had some people that organize meals once a month and go cook for the residents we kind of let, let it be, because it is transitional housing. And I can tell you that Imagine Housing, they have a manager there, they have caseworkers, they work with the folks, because one of the things you want to launch them into another place. Um, my question is, um, you told us kind of what the debt was for the church. 
Uh, what was your deal structure with the management house, and what did you sell? Was it a sale, or was it uh, long term well, lease? Yeah, it, well, it was. We sold them the building rights to air. The air. So, yeah. So they they admit it's there for. It's going to be there forever. Right, but you did not sell the land as such. No, not as such. Okay. Did you go through any sort of appraisal process prior yes. to that? Yes. What was your land value then? Uh, you know, I, I don't remember that. I didn't, in fact, when I left that whole project, I kind of got rid of all except the church. But it's, I, I, I can't remember. We have three and a half acres. Okay. Um, and I guess I was just trying to figure out um, what did you sell the air rights for then? Well, for the building. Right, no, but I meant the amount. Oh, uh, well, that's at 1.3 million. Okay. So, I mean, where their building is. Right. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And the nice thing about where the building is, it's right on the bus route for people to get to work wherever they're going to go. So it's very convenient. Hi, I'm Courtney. I'd like to know some of the ways our congregation was blessed by this process and also by the Well, I think, uh, for me personally, isn't this what we're called to do to help those who are less fortunate and uh, forget about my personal parking spot? Because we can, I mean, we are, all of us in this room are very fortunate. And there are some that are not as fortunate. And I think it's just important, and once you get your head wrapped around this thing, you think, yes, this is what we ought to be doing. Why do we need parking spaces? I mean, you need some, of course. But. And our, our congregation is really accepted that now. It's just kind of second nature that the people come and go. Um, and as I said, they don't really come into our church service. Every once in a while, you'll see one, one or two people come in, but not very often. But we, you know, we shouldn't, and I don't think you should expect that either. My name is Nancy. I just wanted to clarify, your building that you have on your property is totally separated from your actual church structure that doesn't incorporate or share any, any building? No, there's a whole playground in between the two for the kids, uh, but no, it's not right in the it, There's too much of a slope for our building. you uh, implemented for children? Were there any concerns regarding child safety? Uh, there really hasn't been any issue with child safety. You know, our, our kids, they come and go, and, and we have vacation Bible school, but uh, this year we have about 95 kids, sometimes we've got 160 kids, but there really hasn't been any issue with child safety. Imagine housing vets the area very well. I mean, you just don't say, okay, I, I need a place to stay and come in. They, they check out the background of the young folks who are going to be residents. In fact, we have uh, every September, St. Margaret's hosts 30 homeless men. And after last September, a couple of them, I think three moved right into uh, the affordable housing right next door. And of course, from there, they move into other houses as well. <coughs> Any other questions? It's, it's really been uh, a good experience. And I can tell you there are some people that uh, in your congregation will probably come up in several weeks and say, when did this all start? I had a, well, similar to my position as senior warden, and this all was <coughs> oh, about four years prior to me. And after a year, we had quarterly meetings, we wrote in the, in the monthly newsletter, uh, we had announcements in, in church. And he came and he said, Bob, when did this all start? And I said, Cam, it started a year ago. You just have to listen. You're going to have some back. That's just the way my kids. Thank you. 
sometimes people fear that when we do all of this outreach that we can't take care of the people who are already here. Are there any, was there any of that in your congregation that um, you got so busy and so caught up in this housing project that you weren't able to minister to the congregation? No, really, uh, what we had was kind of a, a, a small group. We called it the facilities use team. And uh, we had our group, and we met with Imagine Housing every week. And what we did was report to the congregation. They just did their stuff. They did all the whatever outreach they were going to do. Uh, and we just kind of kept them appraised what was going to happen. Now, the biggest thing was when construction started, of course, that limited everything. But we got through it. It was 18 months, 18, 19 months. But we, we did get through it.
uh, folks kept coming back to what would be the mission of the congregation and seeking to discern what God is calling a congregation to do. The council was not of one mind. The vote was four to two, four four, two against, with two abstentions. I do not know how any of those people voted. I know how I voted. Uh, it was a confidential ballot. Address the concern about the timing of the congregational meeting. Several factors explain the urgency. First, the City of Bellevue only looks at revisions to the comprehensive plan and rezones on a yearly basis in January. Second, Imagine Housing is unable to say at this time if it will partner with St. Luke's if the congregation proposes to delay this a year or more for the approval of the memorandum of understanding. They have uh, options and other opportunities too and we are in their position right now to pursue this. Uh, the Board of Trustees recognize that there are both benefits and risks to the proposal. See the invitation to ministry that you were given when you signed in. Uh, some of you have seen this before. It was a handout. And on the benefits side, there's a clear need for affordable housing in Bellevue. And as Pastor Tom pointed out, the congregation has an opportunity to affect positive the lives of families for years to come. Also from a financial perspective, the proposal estimates the new mortgage will reduce the debt of the congregation by approximately 200 grand. On the risk side, there are no guarantees this project will go forward or be improved by the city of Bellevue. If the proposal does not go through, the congregation will be responsible for one half of the developmental cost. There is a risk here, which could amount to as high as $95,000 if this was delayed to expensive time or we got into it and it was uh, not approved. We share some of that cost. There's also there's many unknowns in the case of any large development, the final financing. And so this is an estimate of a downside the memorandum of understanding has options in there. Remember, the attorney that may explain that that is a general agreement of two parties for the intent of developing this. And there are places there where it could be stopped by either party for a good reason. And that if they're bad, um, if we can't get the approvals or things like this. So there is some risk with that. A follow-up meeting with the City of Bellevue, the Department of Planning and Community Development, indicates a comprehensive plan amendment is consistent with the city's current comprehensive plan. St. Luke's has a narrative for addressing homelessness by affordable housing and is congruent with the city plans. Mansion housing is optimistic or they wouldn't be spending their time or money that this amendment can be approved. There are no guarantees. And I know this is my profession, you go for that, you never know. I'm an engineer involved with design facilities and that. Um, <coughs> And to, to go through all of the risks and pros and cons, look at these handouts and discussions. It was not my position here to list every item of concern people had or what we felt was the reasons to do that. This is a motion that the board has presented to the congregation for their consideration. Uh, and it is a big step and it is concerning and it is positive and it is negative to how you project your views. I do believe everybody that had their views have the interest of this congregation in St. Louis Park. Even though sometimes in debates and discussion we may feel it's personal or there's uh, things that's just dealing with the group, the body of people, and it's a blessing that's been mentioned already that we can discuss and maybe have different views. But yet, we in the body of Christ are working together to do the best we can. Many of us have prayed, look at the things, and then it comes tough with this freedom of choice and responsibility. And uh, Pastor Tom's sermon today was right on point. And so uh, I don't think anybody there was totally against it, or anybody totally for it, with no concerns. But it was very good, healthy dialogue that should take place. Many of you have been heard by the board. Uh, it's a process that is happening. And a personal note that I would ask everyone, and I firmly believe this, is that regardless of which way we end up today, that we leave these doors united 
as the great congregation that we are. And we've got so many positive things and much to build upon and not be divisive. Uh, let's not use Washington, the capital of D.C., as people that are bipartisan polar and do nothing. Once we decide this process, whatever it is, I personally am moving forward positively. Either way, and I hope all of you do too, after we uh, do, do the due process of consideration. Thank you. The Board of Trustees, uh, the motion that was made and passed reads as follows. We, the Board of Trustees, recommend to the congregation that the memorandum of understanding with the Managing Housing be approved as amended, that in paragraph number one, we strike the term 1950s era in a description of the building, and in paragraph 1.1, we strike the word office in terms of uses of the North Wing. So that is the motion. The, the resolution from the Board of Trustees was to approve the memorandum of understanding. Okay, one more quick uh, presentation or statement, if you will, from Mr. Drew on the, uh, on the position of the Future Directions Committee, and then we'll open it up for discussion. The Future Directions Committee's mission is to assure the health of St. Luke's and at the same time honor God's way and mission. We've been in study and conversation and discernment for three years since Sophia Wave's decision. And one of the important readings we've used in this effort is the book, The Twelve Keys to an Effective Church by Keenan Callahan. And the seventh key is, is called One Major Program. Some excerpts from that key I've, uh, I've got a quote here. A strong, healthy congregation has one major program that is among the best in the community that serves many persons and families and has some connection with our one major mission outreach. Regrettably, the more a congregation loses members, the more it seems to invest increasing amounts of leadership, time, and financial resources in more and more programs. It's as if the local congregations seek to recover the busy, bustling days of the programs of the church culture in the 1950s, and I think we referred to that this morning. Those days are gone and done. We look forward to the mission field God now gives us. Uh, we clearly see a downward attendance trajectory. St. Luke's is multi-generational. Things that are looked for by prospective members are, number one, are there no exclusions? And the second one, involvement with local and rural community. We can choose between letting the inevitable happen by doing nothing or we can be proactive and promote change. We need to ask ourselves how reaching out to the less advantaged blesses our congregation. Destiny will not let us off the hook. We can choose change, which will certainly bring hope and joy to St. Luke's. And this is important. The mansion housing opportunity should not be considered an overnight revelation. Uh, it was brought to the attention of the FTC and it closely fit the goals and aspirations of our future as we have envisioned it through our extended period of study. The, part, the opportunity is also directly in line with our refuge, renewal, and an underlying reach motto and our focus on homelessness as well as moving back into the neighborhood. Therefore, the FTC hardly endorses adoption of the imagination I can mention housing and will you, respectively, Prentice Drew, FTC chair. All right, so time for discussion. Now, each of you uh, speak as you will, ask what you will. Uh, please cue up to the microphone at the beginning of your statement. If it's a statement, state if it is for or against, and ask your question at the floor if you have a question. My name is Ruth Hockenberg. <coughs> been a member of the congregation for over 50 years. I've seen many changes, many ups and downs, many financial crises. I'm not opposed to change. I've gone along with it most of the time. But I do have to register a comment. I've read most of the materials that have been provided. <coughs> and then I have seen the references to the 1950s era part of the building. And in most instances, it's been referred to as um, disposable, would be my uh, interpretation. I have to 
for murder of people. Ruth, are you speaking for or against? I, at this point, am neither, but probably not even against. Particularly what I'm against is that area for our family has witnessed many weddings, many christenings, some funerals and mourning, and it is sacred territory or sacred crime. It is also directly in conjunction with the common value, and I think if it's removed and baptized or built around, or many of those things, that common man is violated. And the trust made with the common man is also violated. And I guess I feel, since I was here and witnessed so many of the saints who built the foundation of this church, I'm not sure that the trust the better place in the future generations is not also violent. If I want to promote destruction of that area, I understand that the grounds here are sort of limited in terms of alternative building, but I do think that that would need to be revisited in my mind. And I also know that I'm not Grounds and then not let since I can hardly walk them anymore from the parking lot. So I know that that's a difficult situation. Uh, and, but I did want to articulate that point of view, and I think that you probably would see it underneath many people's objection if they have one or a negative one, is some of those concerns that have just been ignored. Thank you. Leslie Schofield, and I am for it. Obviously, many of you know that. If any of you think that Memorial Hall and Columbarium is going to be destroyed, I would like to correct that, because that is not what is going to happen. We are keeping Memorial Hall. We are keeping the Columbarium right where it is, that we did look at that, but that just, for many reasons, we did not go down that road. What, the part that will be removed is the open portion of Pearson Hall and the North Wing. That is the portion that will be removed and rebuilt. That portion is in dire need of a lot of repair. The North Wing has Quite a bit of dry rot, and we haven't had an estimate how much that would cost, but we probably have to go through and reframe all the windows. My husband has told me that we potentially will need to replace a 30-year-old furnace, and I don't know how much commercial furnaces cost, but you know it's not going to be inexpensive. We also have a dishwasher that we've had for 25 years, and guess what? They cost about $25,000. So we could be in line for many improvements in this church that if we build the new section, that would be taking care of a lot of those problems. Yes, I don't know how the furnace, we haven't, we're just in concept phase right now. But I wanted to correct the thoughts about Memorial Hall and the Columbarium. Thank you. My name is Will Wade. I'm currently a new member of the church. I can't say I'm on four against because I haven't really heard a lot after I came here to hear. Although I, I will say that one of the things that drew me to this church was the, the, the feelings and the works that they do for the needy and the poor. That's what really attracted me to the church. We've been a member, I think, four or five years now. Uh, I guess the only question everybody had is, and I don't understand because I haven't probably anything, but it, it, uh, I don't know what the mortgage is of the church. But it says here that we'll receive 1.9 million from image housing, but we still have a 488 thousand dollar mortgage that's done. So I don't know is a mortgage that I that would cover a mortgage. Uh, anyone care to answer that? Listen. What happens, Bill, is we are paid approximately 1.9 million. At the balance at that time of the mortgage, it will 
some of those funds would be go to the mortgage to pay it off. So for the time of construction, we will not have a mortgage payment. The remainder of that fund is what goes to build the new portion again. So does that explain it to you? Okay. I'm Margaret Nickel, and I have a question, so I'm not making a statement for or against because I'm not really sure right now. Uh, one of my questions, it's kind of twofold, it has to do with the appraised value of the church when we get into the actual contractual side of the agreement. Right now, all the numbers are being based on the tax rule of evaluation of the property, is my understanding. Will there be an opportunity, potentially, if the appraisal shows more of a market value, that we'll, we will receive a higher return in those numbers than what's currently projected? And in other words, could potentially reduce our mortgage further. Okay, the question's been put to the floor. <laughs> Leslie? I don't think that's really been looked at. What Imagine Housing does is looks at how much they can build a project for to make it the numbers work for them with all the loans that they get from the government federal funds, state funds, arch funds, all of the different resources. They have to come in at a certain number to make the property work. At this point, I believe, Carolyn, correct me if I'm wrong, isn't it 37,000 per unit? Okay. And then that, obviously, times 52, um, that is where the number comes from. It's not really on the value of our land. Now, I have heard said that without, you know, we're losing money on the value of our land. But right now, our land is zoned at R.25. And that means two and a half houses, and I get the half house, per acre. And we have how many acres right now? Four and a half. Four and a half. So we have four and a half acres of which portion of it is not usable. And we're saying, oh, it's only worth 12 or 13 million. Okay, or 8 million, or whatever the number is. Well, zoned as it is, I don't know of many builders that would want to pay 10 million for a piece of property like this to put up a three or four million dollar home on Bellevue Way. Does that answer your question? It does. I think that also there is a uh, there is a memorandum of understanding that has been written, and that is what we are agreeing to. There is a price that is included in that memorandum of understanding of thirty-seven thousand per unit. However, at the beginning of the memorandum, there is also a statement that the project, which covers what we're doing, will largely conform to what we have in the memorandum. So I, I'd have to actually look to our legal counsel to help with the construction of that, whether or not by, by approving this memorandum, are we agreeing to 37K per unit, or are we agreeing to approximately 37K per unit? Thanks. So the answer is the latter. Um, a memorandum of understanding by its very nature is an agreement to make an agreement. And because there are unknowns with respect to the process going through Bellevue and uh, the total number of units that can be built, at this point, um, the best guess is approximately $37,000 per unit. But the, the agreement is written with enough flexibility that everyone needs to realize that that number might go up or down. This is a statement uh, for the project. Um, I'm an educator. My whole life has been about um, supporting um, kids who don't have what they need. Um, but that's not what this is about. This is about helping to handle and homelessness. The units are not all going to go to homeless families in Bellevue. I know that. Um, I didn't mean to make that direct correlation when I've spoken to the congregation before. I just happen to be very aware of the homelessness on the east side because I do work with children and families. I've been a member of this congregation for 30 years. My husband and I have raised our children in this congregation. This has been a very important part of their upbringing. And one of the things that kept us coming here was the social justice aspect of this congregation and the fact that we looked outside of our own walls to the needs of others. 
We've gone to Mexico to serve others. Um, we send money overseas. We send quilts overseas. There's plenty of need right here in our own community. And I would urge us to look outside of our own walls, not build a fortress around us, because we want to make sure that everything stays the same. And I would encourage us to look at how we can be a vibrant part of this community by going out those doors and looking at the needs and not expecting the people who need us to come here looking for us. Thank you.